With all the very latest for you this Thursday lunchtime now, it's the ITV News. The Duchess of Sussex wins her latest battle with the press. Meghan hails the ruling against the Mail on Sunday as a victory for anyone who's felt scared to stand up for what is right. Also this lunchtime, parties are on but kissing is out. Ministers accused of mixed messaging about how to stay safe this Christmas. Alec Baldwin gives his first interview after the tragic shooting on his film set. Well, the trigger wasn't pulled. I didn't pull the trigger. So you never pulled the trigger? No, 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 no. I, I would never point a gun at anyone and pull a trigger at them, never. And we'll be speaking live to England women's highest ever goal scorer, Ellen White. This is the ITV Lunchtime News with Romilly Weeks. Good afternoon. The Duchess of Sussex has won the latest round of her legal battle against Associated Newspapers, the publishers of the Mail on Sunday, for breaching her privacy. The Court of Appeal ruled that the newspaper should not have published a letter she sent to her estranged father, which she described as personal and private. In a statement released shortly after the judgment, Meghan said it was a victory not just for her, but for anyone who's felt scared to stand up for what is right. Geraint Vincent has the latest. In her long and determined legal battle against the newspaper, another victory for the Duchess. The High Court ruled earlier this year that Meghan's privacy had been breached when the Mail on Sunday published parts of a letter she'd written to her father. This morning, judges rejected the publisher's appeal against that decision. The Court of Appeal upheld the judge's decision that the Duchess had a reasonable expectation of privacy in the contents of the letter. And those contents were personal, private, and not matters of legitimate public interest. The Duchess of Sussex wrote the letter to her father, Thomas, in the summer of 2018. Her barristers told the court that it was deeply personal and self-evidently it was intended to be kept private. The judges also heard that 585 of the letter's 1,250 words had been published across five articles in the Mail on Sunday. Appeal judges ruled that the publication had not been justified or proportionate. In a written statement this morning, Meghan said that this is a victory not just for me, but for anyone who's ever felt scared to stand up for what's right. What matters most is that we are now collectively brave enough to reshape a tabloid industry that conditions people to be cruel and profits from the lies and pain that they create. Legal victory has not come without some embarrassment for the Duchess. She had to apologise for misleading the court at one point, saying she had forgotten how a palace aide had given information to journalists who were writing a book about her and Prince Harry. But it is a victory nonetheless, and one that Meghan clearly hopes will change much about the relationship between newspapers and the people whose stories they try to tell. Geraint Vincent, ITV News. Well, let's get more on this story from our royal editor, Chris Shipp. Chris, this was a hugely anticipated decision and another really important moment for the Duchess of Sussex. Yeah, it is exactly that. And I think, Romilly, people will be forgiven for thinking that they've heard this story an, a number of times before. And yes, it has been a very long, drawn-out uh, legal process. And one of the key reasons it's been so drawn out is that the Mail on Sunday wanted this whole thing to go to trial. They disagreed with the previous judge who decided in Meghan's favour without trial. It's called a summary uh, judgment. And they wanted things to be tested uh, in this trial, like the fact that Meghan forgot that her uh, team already had a meeting with the authors of that book, like the fact that the letter was discussed uh, in draft form with her press secretary, including when she discussed whether to use the word daddy in order to pull at the heartstrings in case it were leaked. 
But I think what we learned from this is that the right to privacy trounces everything else. And this was a personal and private letter uh, from Meghan to her father, no matter who she shared it with or drafted it with in advance. And that, therefore, has allowed Meghan uh, and, of course, Harry uh, to uh, condemn this particular element of the British press, the tabloid press, that they so, uh, they so fiercely detest. Right, Chris, thank you. Next, the government has ordered millions more doses of COVID jabs to future-proof the vaccination programme. And there's more good news, too, about a new drug being signed off, which experts are hopeful will help treat the Omicron variant. However, the government is still facing questions about what it's saying is safe and what is not this festive season, as Faye Barker reports. Efforts continue apace to get people protected on what's the first anniversary of the COVID-19 vaccine's approval in the UK. The government says it's now secured enough booster doses to run into next year and the year after, 114 million in total. As we're seeing right now, there's a new variant, uh, there's, there's potentially new variants in the future. We know that COVID's going to be around for a while. We have to learn to live with it. And one of the ways to learn to live with it is to make sure we've got the vaccines that we need and that they're future proof. And that's just the kind of order we've given for 114 million vaccines to make sure we've got what we need for the long term. A new COVID-19 treatment has been approved too today by UK regulators, which the makers say works against the new Omicron variant. But the pressures on the NHS and GPs are still a worry as the vaccine rollout steps up. Pharmacies say they will continue to step in. Pharmacies have already given over 15 million COVID jabs, including 2 million boosters. Uh, and after the mass vaccination centres are wound down, Pharmacies will still be there for the long haul out of this nightmare. It's turning into the nightmare before Christmas for festive parties, with research today suggesting nearly half have been cancelled. The government has said there's no need to do so. But the message is mixed, with one minister last night urging caution. Well, for what it's worth, I, you know, I don't think there should be much snogging under the mistletoe. Uh, <laughs> you don't need to do things like that. Uh, but I think uh, we should all be trying to enjoy... Uh, the Christmas ahead of us. Well, I think it is sending out mixed signals because if there are going to be restrictions on what businesses can do and what they can expect over the festive period, well, the government would have to support them. So it's got to be clear about what it's asking people to do. With so much uncertainty, people are looking and hoping answers will come soon. Faye Barker, ITV News. Well, let's talk a bit more about how the government is communicating what we should all be doing with our deputy political editor, Anushka Astana. Anushka, with COVID cases still high and concern about Omicron and how it's going to affect all of our Christmases, it's really important that government guidance Your Christmas is arranged. clear, isn't it? Well, it certainly is, and clearly this is quite confusing. I mean, I, for one, am not sure whether I should or should not be trying to snog strangers this Christmas. I suspect my husband thinks probably not. But look, seriously, Therese Coffey, I think, meant to make those comments in a light-hearted way. But I can sort of imagine the sigh in Downing Street every time a minister says different things. Sources there are clear that the only new restrictions are the ones that have been announced around borders, around mass and around contact if someone has had the Omicron case needing to isolate. But clearly, it is a bit confusing and there are different ways that you can interpret these things. For example, the Department for Education advice on nativity plays is that, yes, they can go ahead, but schools and nurseries need to decide whether it's right in their situation. And clearly, for all of us, even if the rules say you can go ahead with Christmas parties, everyone is seeing the news about Omicron, knowing that we don't have the answers yet, and obviously worrying about it. Thank you, Anushka in Westminster. And if you're wondering about whether or not you should have a Christmas party, we've got an article with your COVID questions answered on our website. That's at itv.com slash news. Police in South London are searching for an 11-year-old boy who hasn't been seen since Tuesday. Mohammed Khan is from Afghanistan and arrived here less than a month ago. He was last seen in Deptford when he went to play football in a park near to where he's staying. And members of the military are being drafted in to help with the aftermath of Storm Arwen. Thousands of people are still without power six days on in parts of northern England and Scotland. It's been described as a once-in-a-generation event. 
The actor Alec Baldwin has said he did not pull the trigger of the gun that went off on his film set, killing cinematographer Helena Hutchins. She died in October after being shot with a prop gun loaded with a live round. In his first interview since the shooting, the 63-year-old broke down in tears and described Miss Hutchins as someone who was loved by everyone. Emma Patterson reports. It's six weeks since Alec Baldwin fatally shot cinematographer Helena Hutchins on the film set of Rust. Speaking out for the first time, the actor says he didn't pull the trigger. It wasn't in the script for the trigger to be pulled. Well, the trigger wasn't pulled. I didn't pull the trigger. So you never pulled the trigger? No, 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 no. no. I, I would never point a gun at anyone and pull a trigger at them, never. How did a real bullet get on that set? I have no idea. Someone put a live bullet in a gun, a bullet that wasn't even supposed to be on the property. A promotional clip of the interview showed the actor breaking down in tears, saying he has no idea how a live bullet came to be in the gun. She was someone who was loved by everyone who worked with and liked by everyone who worked with and admired. You described it as a one in a trillion shot and the gun was in your hand. How do you come to terms with that? Baldwin says he was unknowingly handed a loaded weapon by an assistant director who indicated it was safe to use. The Hollywood actor allegedly fired the fatal shot from that gun. Hutchins was flown to hospital after the shooting but later died of her injuries. Director Joel Souza was also wounded. You said you're not a victim, but is this the worst thing that's ever happened to you? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I, I think back... And I think of what could I have done. Around 500 rounds of ammunition, some of them live, were found on the film set by New Mexico authorities. The shooting is currently under investigation with a new search warrant issued to ascertain how live bullets may have ended up on the film set. The incident caused widespread debates on the use of firearms on film sets with calls for industry safety standards to be tightened. The interview is set to air in full in America tonight. Emma Patterson, ITV News. Still to come, we'll be speaking live to Lioness Ellen White about the hat trick that kicked her into the record books and what's being done to help the dogs getting into difficulty breathing. Plunging winter temperatures combined with rising energy bills are putting extra financial strain on millions of people. A charity is warning that this winter could be the worst we've ever seen for fuel poverty, with many more households finding they can't afford to keep warm. National Energy Action says that average domestic energy bills have already soared by over £230 per customer compared to last winter. Over the same period, those on the lowest wages have seen their income plummet by over £1,000 per year. And 60% of British adults say they surveyed, they surveyed plan to reduce their heating use by a fair amount due to rising costs. Well, I'm joined by Adam Scorer from National Energy Action. Adam, thank you so much for joining us to discuss this. This is a really worrying time for many families, isn't it? Looking at the temperatures plummet and wondering whether they can just afford to keep the heating on or not. Well, it, it's horrific. So many families dread every winter. In, but this time in particular, with the price rises we've seen already, but the big shift is going to happen towards the end of winter in April when the price cap, the, the energy regulator's price cap will rise again. <clears throat> and at that point, if analysts are to believe, and I hope they're wrong, I hope they're overshooting, the cost of heating a home, because most of us heat our home through gas, will have doubled over an 18-month period. Now, incomes haven't doubled. People on a knife edge are still facing the same sort of choices. And the reality is... There's no amount of savvy little tips for keeping warm that's going to put that's going to enable people to to draw the sting out of these price rises. It's going to be a miserable winter for so many. And in past years, the advice would have been to search around for a better deal. But there just aren't those deals out there, are there, with all these companies going bust? No, they're not. And actually, people on the lowest incomes and in the least efficient homes, that was never really an option anyway, especially if you're in debt or, you're pay or you heat your home through a prepayment meter, those sorts of market options were pretty closed off. But it's the scale of the increase, especially at a time when for many incomes have plummeted, the cost of living is increasing. And then you say for over an 18 month period, it costs twice the amount of money just to keep warm. The, the answer, of course, is that people will not keep warm. 
we have seen the first taste of winter, people who can't heat their homes because of because of the storm and the and, and being off supply. Well, that's not a once in a generation issue for many households. That's every winter and it's just got a whole lot worse. And you say there's no amount of tips that are really going to help people save money. But but are there a few things that people can do to, to just save a few months? Oh, 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 of course. And I think the key ones are probably to look at your thermostat. If, if you can safely lower it by a degree, then do that. Make sure it comes in. On, on, make sure the, the heating kicks in at the right time and you heat the rooms that you need to heat. Try to block up as many drafts. Try to get as much support as you can from your, your energy supplier, really critically. But, you know, the cost of heating has doubled. Will have doubled over an 18-month yeah. period. Adam, it's damaged I'm going to have to stop you there, but thank you so much for joining us and, and setting out all of that. And now time for some sport. When England's women played Latvia this week in the World Cup qualifiers, it was a match like no other. The Lionesses won with a staggering 20-0 victory. And three of those goals came from one superstar player, striker Ellen White. Her hat-trick has made her England women's highest ever goal scorer. With 48 goals in 101 appearances. And we can catch up with the woman of the hour herself now. Ellen, so great to have you with us. How are you feeling after that match, breaking the record and that, frankly, unbelievable scoreline? Thank you. Um, yeah, it just feels so surreal, to be honest. Um, yeah, I think when I did break it in the game, uh, I felt very emotional. You can probably see by my celebration. But, yeah, I feel very honoured um, to, to be part of this England squad and uh, obviously to surpass Kelly Smith's record. She is uh, an unbelievable player, a legend of the game, and I've got so much love and respect for her. But, yeah, I feel really lucky and proud, to be honest. And talking of records, how long do you think before you can break Wayne Rooney's goal-scoring record? And what do you say to those who say you can't compare the men and women's game in that regard? Um, to be honest, I'm just focusing on what I can control, really. Um, you know, hopefully that everyone can see the passion and love we have for the game. Um, and, you know, for me, I just I just want to work hard and do whatever I can for the team to help the team win. I absolutely love playing for England. Um, and, you know, hopefully I can score more goals. But, uh, but yeah, first and foremost, if I can help the team win and achieve something special with this England team. Absolutely. And how do you feel about the shape the team is in ahead of the World Cup? Yeah, I think, I think for us, we're in a really great position. Obviously, we've won six out of six in our qualification for the World Cup. Um, and, you know, we've ended the year on a really big high, uh, two big wins. And uh, we've got a, a great camp in February against some phenomenal teams. So, uh, yeah, I think at the moment we're in a great place and, and hopefully, you know, we'll continue to, to be on this path and, and keep improving, really. Let's hope. And I suspect there'll be a lot of people watching this who have felt really inspired by what you do and what you've done for the whole sport. Well, um, I really appreciate that. And, you know, if we can do anything to inspire anyone, and for me, I just want everyone to enjoy playing football with a smile on the face. I absolutely love what, what I do, and I feel very honoured and privileged to, to be in this position and, and play for my country, really. And that really comes through. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. We've heard the saying, a dog is for life, not just for Christmas. But if you're on the lookout for a new four-legged friend this month, are you aware of the potential health problems they might have? In recent years, breeding issues have led to more dogs having breathing difficulties. And now experts are trying to stop that from happening. Chloe Keedy has been finding out more. Well, I've made some new friends this morning. Let me introduce you to Violet here. And this is Cedric, both gorgeous French bulldogs. They're one of the most popular breeds. And I can see why, uh, but flat-faced dogs are prone to breathing difficulties. So how do you know if you're getting a healthy dog? Right, down you get. Come over here with me. Here to tell me more about that is Jane. Hi, Jane, you've nice got to meet you. a, a much more sedate-looking <laughs> dog with you. You've got the easier job. Jane's a vet. Uh, and she's done a lot of work in this in this area. So first of all, tell me who you've got here, Jay. So I've got Dallas. She is a seven-month-old French bulldog, and she is Cedric's daughter. Oh, she's gorgeous, she very is. relaxed, and she's a healthy dog, is she? Uh, well, at the moment, she looks great. So the French bulldog breed standard has been slightly modified. Actually, it was announced today, and you're now meant to have a prominent muzzle, and she certainly has that. She's got nice nostrils, not too much wrinkling, and a decent neck. So. So she looks great, but at this age, you can't tell whether a dog is going to have breathing problems or not. Right. 
So what should people do? So BOAS is a functional disease, and the, real, the way to test it properly is to look at the dog's breathing function before and after a little exercise test. And we can do that now with the respiratory functional grading scheme, which was launched by the Kennel Club and University of Cambridge in 2019. And this tests the parents, and if, you, if your parents are tested and are clear of BOAS or zero or one grade, then you're less likely to have affected puppies. So the way to find yourself a, a better puppy is to use parents that have been tested by the Kennel Assured Breeders. Okay, and how does it work? Is it a simple test? It's a very simple test. We just listen to the dogs on the side of the neck. Sorry, Dallas, just going to come in here. Uh, and then we exercise them for three minutes, and then we listen to them again. And we're looking at the differences before and after the exercise test and whether we can hear any noise at all. So we don't want to be able to hear these dogs um, after they've exercised. So it's not as simple as going and choosing a Christmas present. It takes time with a dog, doesn't That's it? That's exactly the right message. So if you want a really good, healthy puppy, then you might have to wait for a few months to get it. Okay. But actually, you're going to live with this dog for years. Do you want a healthy pet who's a pleasure to you and your family? or do you want a dog that's diseased and you have to have treated and have expensive vet bills and worry about them so it's worth waiting so that is the message if you're thinking of choosing a dog this Christmas and looking at these two how could you resist it is, of course, the 2nd of December, so we end the programme with a Bake Off extravaganza to help kick off the holiday season. Gingerbread City in London's Belgravia is a festive collection of biscuity buildings from skyscrapers to stations. It's all constructed to the very highest level by architects and civil engineers with prizes up for grabs for the best bakes. It just seems to really delight um, children, their parents, and also adults. Um, I think people are naturally interested in buildings and the way that city goes together. And sometimes they say, I'm not into architecture, but actually they are into gingerbread and cakes and sweets. So it's a really good way to translate all of those ideas. And a reminder of our top story this lunchtime. The Duchess of Sussex has won the latest round of her legal battle against the publishers of the Mail on Sunday for breaching her privacy. The Court of Appeal ruled that the newspaper should not have published a letter she sent to her father, which she described as personal and private. In a statement, Meghan said it was a victory not just for her, but for anyone who's felt scared to stand up for what is right. And that is it this lunchtime. I'll be back with the evening news at 6.30. The news where you are follows the national weather. From everyone here, goodbye.